Hello everybody, it's me, your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete, and this is my series, Nails in a Coffin, where we learn that with great kills, there must also come great nails. If you're new here, firstly, thank you for checking out this video, I really do appreciate it. I perform a kill analysis on the on-screen kills in horror movies, and I rate the victim's actions and decisions on a scale of one nail in a coffin to four nails in a coffin. A one nail kill is when the kill could have easily been avoided without the dumb decisions made by the victim, like splitting up or running upstairs when you should have run outside. And I go up to four nails. A four nail kill is where the kill was unavoidable, there weren't really any dumb decisions made, or the victim fought really hard before he or she was killed. So, again, thank you for checking out this video, and I would really appreciate it if you leave me a like and a comment. And if you haven't already, Hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to grow this channel and I would really appreciate your support. I put a video out every Friday. We're having a lot of fun doing this, so I appreciate you taking this journey with me. What movie are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to continue our trip through Texas with 2003's remake of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This movie was directed by Marcus Nispel, who also directed the remake of Friday the 13th. In my opinion, this movie is by far the better remake. I really do enjoy a lot about this movie. Some of the notable cast members in the 2003 remake of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre are Arlie Ermey from Full Metal Jacket. You will not laugh! You will not cry! And Jessica Biel, who I actually found out there, she and I went to different high schools together. So let's do a quick recap of the movies I've covered so far and talk about the average Nails in the Coffin rating across all the deaths in those movies. The first Texas Chainsaw Massacre had an average Nails in the Coffin rating of 1.4. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 had an average of 1.8 Nails. Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 had an average of 1.2 Nails in a Coffin. And our most recent coverage, Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation had an average Nails in a Coffin rating of 1.7. So, how do you guys think the remake is going to do with Nails in a Coffin? Well, sit back, relax, let's find out. You know how it goes by now? Get those chainsaws running, and let's put some Nails in a Coffin for 2003's remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The movie opens up with narration by John Larroquette, who, of course, narrated the opening text crawl to the 1974 original. However, this time, the text crawl is gone, but it is replaced with some police archival evidence footage covering the events that had taken place. We next meet our five young adults traveling in a van on their way back from Mexico through Texas on their way to a Leonard Skinner concert. We get to meet Erin, her boyfriend Kemper, Morgan, Andy, and Pepper. In the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the kids in a van pick up Nubbins, this real sketchy looking hitchhiker. However, in the remake, Kemper is driving along and he takes his eyes off the road for a little bit to kiss Erin. So when he takes his eyes back onto the road, he almost hits this young woman who's walking in the middle of the road. How he didn't see her before he took his eyes off the road to kiss Erin doesn't make much sense because she really just didn't appear out of nowhere. So they pull over, they go to help this girl out because she seemed really shooken up not in good shape, and they pick her up and take her in a van with her and start driving back down the road. They're talking to this young girl in the van as they're driving along, and she's not making much sense, but she's been through something very traumatic. She's telling the kids in the van that they're all dead. They're all dead. But they don't know how to take this seriously. Morgan is just kind of making jokes. Oh my God, I'm too high for this. And he's kind of the annoying character in the movie. He's the Franklin, but he's not half as annoying as Franklin. So they're talking to the young girl. And then she sees that Kemper is going back in the direction of where she just escaped from. You're going the wrong way. Well, she's definitely not going to go back there. So she flips out. She's screaming at them. You're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. And, you know, so she lunches at Kemper, who's driving, and he's forced to, you know, slam on the brakes and stop the van in the middle of the road. Once they're pulled over on the side of the road, the young woman takes out a gun she had hidden underneath her dress. 
and she quickly tells all the kids in the van, You're all gonna die. And then before they realize what's going on or they can really even do anything, she puts the gun in her mouth, pulls the trigger, and kills herself. Really can't show much of this kill on YouTube, but if you're watching this video, I'm pretty sure you've seen the movie so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And there really is a really good shot of the kids in the van, their reaction if they just witnessed this, you know, horrendous suicide. The young woman dies at just 10 minutes into the movie, and I had to put a fair amount of thought into how many nails in a coffin I was going to give her because, you know, unfortunately she did commit suicide. But I'm thinking, you know, she probably had to experience something really, you know, traumatic and horrific that in her mind this was her only option because she could not, would not, you know, go back to the house where she just escaped from. So with a fair amount of thought, like I said, I'm going to give her two nails in the coffin considering everything that she, you know, she had to experience. While they're waiting on the sheriff, they do run across this young boy, Jedediah, who probably needs to go see the dentist. Okay, maybe not that dentist. Jedediah tells the group that the sheriff should be at home right now and offers to show Aaron and Kemper where it's at. So Aaron and Kemper follow Jedediah to the Hewitt house. Now, in this movie, they renamed the family from Sawyer to Hewitt for reasons. So there they meet Monty, an amputee in a wheelchair, and he allows Aaron to go inside the house and use the phone to try and call the sheriff again to find out where he's at. And Kemper has to wait outside because he doesn't want too many people in his house to make it dirty. And then once you see inside his house, you realize that really doesn't make much sense. After Kemper calls the sheriff's station, she gets distracted by Monty, who pretended to fall in the bathroom. And we quickly see that Monty is a really gross creep. Turns out this is kind of a planned distraction, because when Kemper goes inside the house to look for his girlfriend... He's looking around, you know, he's opening doors and something falls to the ground. He nails down the pick it up and before he can react or he even knows what's going on, Leatherface shows up behind him and bashes him in there with the hand. <laughs> we next see Leatherface dragging the body, you know, down into the basement area where we get the traditional metal door slam with a nice callback to Kurt's kill in the 1974 movie. Kemper was killed at 32 minutes into the movie. Now, this kill, like I said, was very similar to Kurt's death in the 1974 movie. Now, when I covered that one, I gave Kurt one nail in a coffin. But that was because he w walked into somebody else's house uninvited. With Kemper, it was slightly different. He went in the house to look for his girlfriend because she hadn't come back out yet. And he was kneeling down on the floor and hit from behind in the head with a hammer by Leatherface, which killed him. So this was different than Kurt's death, which is why I'm going to give Kemper a few more points and give him two nails in a coffin for his death. Erin hears the commotion of Kemper getting killed, so she goes to look through the house to see if she can find him. She can't, so she thinks maybe Kemper went back with the rest of her friends, and she goes back to where her friends are, where they tell her that the sheriff just left with the body, but... Kemper's not there, and you can see how concerned Aaron is becoming. Aaron has a lot of concerns since she can't find Kemper, so she and Andy decide to go back to the Hewitt house to go see if they can find him. Aaron is outside distracting Monty while Andy goes inside to look around the house to see if he can find what had happened to Kemper. Andy is looking around the house, he gets into the kitchen. And he knocks a bunch of stuff off the top of the refrigerator and it causes this, you know, loud crash. Erin was outside with Monty. She hears this commotion, so she runs inside to go, you know, see what happened. Her and Andy are staying in the hallway. Monty had wheeled himself in and he is pissed. He actually tells the kids. You turd. You're so dead you don't even know it. And then he starts banging his cane on the floor like he's calling for somebody. And then we all know who suddenly shows up behind Aaron and Andy. <laughs> Leatherface chases Aaron and Andy out of the house. Aaron is running back to the mill. Andy, for some reason, starts to run through all this hanging laundry out in front of the house. 
Leatherface is able to catch up to Andy and he cuts off Andy's leg with his chainsaw. Leatherface picks up Andy and carries him back into the house. He then takes him into his butcher room, I guess you can call it. And he picks Andy up and places him up on this large meat hook, which is another callback to the 1974 film. And then he kind of treats Andy's stump like a steak with salt and butcher paper. Erin runs back to the van with Morgan and Pepper. And she's trying to start the van so she can get out of there and get some help. But before they can start it and drive up, the sheriff shows up. Erin thinks she's saved for a second, but we all know better. And by the way, I think Arlie Ermey does such an amazing job in his movie. This sheriff is almost as scary as Leatherface. He really is the star of this movie as far as, you know, the evil villain goes. So the sheriff finds a joint on the dashboard in the van and he tells all the kids to get out of the van and he puts their faces in the dirt in front of the van. And he just starts terrorizing, you know, these poor kids. He's shooting a gun over their heads and... I love Jessica Biel's performance in this movie. She's just terrified and scared. So is Pepper. So eventually the sheriff picks up Morgan and puts him inside the van, gives him a gun and tells Morgan to show him how the girl had killed herself earlier. Well, Morgan doesn't know the gun is not loaded and he puts the gun, pulls the gun on the sheriff, pulls the trigger. Nothing happens. So gives this gives the sheriff a good excuse to arrest Morgan and take him away from Aaron and Pepper. After the sheriff leaves with Morgan, we see Aaron and Pepper in the van. And I think the sheriff must have taken the keys to the van because Aaron has to hotwire the van. She's able to get it started, but as soon as she goes to drive off, the front right tire of the van falls off. And as soon as this happens, Leatherface uh, attacks the van with his chainsaw. He's trying to get in, he saws through the roof, and then he's able to make a hole so he can reach his arm in, and he grabs Aaron by the hair. When this happens, Pepper is able to get out of the van and try and run away, but Leatherface is quickly behind her. She kind of tries to slow him down a little bit by throwing his metal drum at him and whatnot, but she's not able to slow him down enough. He gets her quickly in the back with the chainsaw, which causes her to fall on the ground. And then he stands over her and kills her with his chainsaw. Pepper is killed at one hour into the movie. And I'm going to give her two nails in the coffin. She tried to get away. She even tried to slow Leatherface down. And she had lived a nightmare in the last few hours being terrorized by the sheriff, witnessing a suicide, being attacked by this giant man with a chainsaw. I, I don't think she deserves one now in the coffin, so I'm going to give Pepper for her death at one hour and two nails in the coffin. After Leatherface is done killing Pepper, he turns to look at Erin, who's just witnessed this inside the van, and Erin unfortunately sees that Leatherface is wearing Kemper's face as a skin mask. And this is a heck of a scene, because it goes in slow motion. We see the feathers from Pepper's jacket, slowly falling around him, and Erin's reaction to seeing her boyfriend's face on Leatherface. It, it's a pretty intense scene for the movie, and it's one of my favorites. Leatherface then chases Erin through the woods, and Erin is able to find this mobile home. And again, I love Jessica Biel's performance in this movie. She really shows Tara exceptionally well. She's able to get inside the mobile home where we, we meet Harrietta and the tea lady. And there's also a young baby in the mobile home as well. She's trying to explain to him what's going on. But unfortunately for Erin, they give her this cup of tea and kind of make her drink it really fast, trying to tell her to calm down. Again, unfortunately for Erin, she drinks the tea. It was drugged and it causes her to pass out. Erin then wakes up. And she's laying on the floor with the sheriff sitting over her, pouring beer on her face. Soon, Leatherface picks Erin up and throws her down into the basement. Erin's looking around the basement and she finds Andy, still alive, just barely hanging on the meat hook. She can't get him off no matter what she does. You know, she just can't help Andy at this time. And Andy asks her to, you know, please put him out of his misery. She doesn't have much of a choice. She goes to find a knife and she kills Andy ending his suffering. 
Andy dies in an hour and 10 minutes in, and I'm giving him two nails in the coffin. He took a lot of abuse. When we first saw him being attacked by Leatherface, he's got this tire iron, and he tells Eren to go run, and he's trying to hold off Leatherface. Now, I don't think Andy made a smart decision when he was running through all that hanging laundry. He kind of gave himself an unnecessary obstacle, and it caused him to, you know, get caught and have his leg cut off. And when Leatherface put him on the hook, Andy did try and lift himself off the hook. So this guy took a lot of abuse. And if I was in his situation, I can't say I wouldn't have asked Aaron to do the same thing. So I think Andy deserves at least two nails in a coffin. After Andy dies, Aaron finds Morgan sitting in this filthy tub. And he also has a hole in his back. So, you can pretty much imagine he was placed on a hook as well. But Morgan is not dead. He's, you know, barely alive. Aaron helps Morgan out of the tub. And then Jedediah shows up in the basement. And he helps Aaron and Andy, excuse me, he helps Aaron and Morgan find a way out of the basement where they're still being chased by Leatherface. Leatherface is chasing him through the woods. But Aaron and Morgan are able to find this old, dilapidated house. Leatherface finds Erin where she's hiding, and he pulls her through the wall. Morgan sees this, so he comes out of a little area where he was hiding from, and he goes to attack Leatherface, trying to save Erin. During a struggle, Leatherface is able to knock Erin down to the ground. Now, also, Morgan has his hands bound together, and they still are. Leatherface is able to pick Morgan up, you know, with his hands over his head and hangs him on the chandelier. So Morgan is just, you know, dangling there. Leatherface picks up his chainsaw, sticks it between Morgan's legs and pulls up on it, killing Morgan. I'm giving Morgan three nails in the coffin. Now yet, he was annoying at the beginning of the movie, but he sacrificed himself to save Aaron while he was gravely injured. He had, you know, his teeth knocked out. He was being tortured. You know, he was even, you know, placed on a meat hook as well because you can see the hole in his back. And he probably knew he was going to die trying to attack Leatherface. And he just wanted to save Aaron. And that's what I'm looking for, for a, you know, for a three or a four nail kill. So, Morgan, I think you earned three nails in the coffin. After Morgan is killed, Aaron is still trying to run away from Leatherface. And he chases her until Aaron finds this meat packing plant. She runs inside and she's looking for places to hide as Leatherface is stalking her. Eventually, Erin is able to find this meat cleaver sitting on a table. She grabs it and then she decides to hide in one of the lockers inside the plant. Erin is able to get the jump on Leatherface by springing out one of the lockers and she's able to actually cut his arm off with the meat cleaver. This slows down Leatherface just enough so she can run out of the building. Erin is picked up in the middle of the road. It's raining outside. And she's picked up by somebody in an 18-wheeler. Another nice callback to the original. So then, you know, she sees that the truck driver is, again, going back to where she just escaped from. So, just like the young woman from the beginning of the movie, she freaks out, telling him, you know, you can't go that way. And it causes the truck driver to have to, you know, slam on the brakes, stop the truck, and, you know, he gets out of the cab of the truck to go you know figure out what the hell is really going on the truck driver just so happens to stop in front of the sheriff's house we next see the sheriff with his gun he's looking inside the truck and then we see Erin that she's hot wiring a vehicle and this is some nice little bit of misdirection because as the sheriff opens up the door to the truck to look inside you know some would expect to see Erin in there but she was hot running the sheriff's vehicle, so as soon as he opens the door and sees nobody in there, Aaron starts the sheriff's car, puts it in a drive, and runs him over. He's not dead after she runs him over originally, so she does the smart decision, and she backs up over him, and then runs over him again. I'm giving the sheriff one now in the coffin, because he had multiple opportunities to kill Aaron. She was passed out. He could have killed her, but they just wanted her to throw her down the basement so they can prolong the torture and whatnot. And this is very synonymous with the Sawyer slash Hewitt family. 
they have big egos and I've given, you know, a lot of the Sawyers, you know, one nail in the coffin because they like to showboat and, you know, boast about everything instead of killing somebody when they have the chance. And I gave them one nail in the coffin and, you know, for some of those reasons, I'm also going to give the sheriff one nail in the coffin. At the very end of the movie, we have our final kill. And we go back to the beginning of the movie looking at the archival evidence footage. And John Larroquette's narration states that the crime scene was not properly secured and two investigating officers were killed. We only see one of them get killed because the other one is holding the camera. And it's really quick, so I'm only going to rate the one officer that we actually saw get attacked by Leatherface and killed. And I'm going to give him one nail in the coffin because, like John Larroquette's narration said... The crime scene wasn't properly secured and it was shoddy police work, which is stupid and it's bad decision making. So the final kill in 2003's Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, one of the investigating officers is only going to get one nail in the coffin. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Those are my nails in the coffin ratings for 2003's remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So let's have a summary. The teenage girl, two nails in the coffin. Kemper, two nails in a coffin. Pepper, I gave her two nails in a coffin. Andy, also two nails in the coffin. Morgan, he earned three nails in a coffin. The sheriff, he got himself one nail in a coffin. And for our final death in the movie, I gave the investigating officer one nail in the coffin. That gives us an average of 1.9 nails in a coffin for the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now let's take a summary of the first five movies in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. The first Texas Chainsaw Massacre had an average nails in a coffin rating of 1.4. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 had an average of 1.8 nails. Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 had an average of 1.2 nails. Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation had an average of 1.7 nails, and we just learned that the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre had an average nails in a coffin rating of 1.9. Again, I want to thank everybody for checking out this video. I really do appreciate it. And if you wouldn't mind leaving me a like and a comment down below, let me know what you thought. Again, if you disagreed or agreed. And if you haven't done so by now, I would greatly appreciate it if you can hit that subscribe button. I put a video out every week, and next week I will be covering the prequel to this movie with Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Beginning. So we're going to have to wait till next week to find out how that movie compares to the rest of the movies in the franchise. Again, let me know down below what you thought. And I want everybody to take care, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. I am your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete, and remember that with great kills, there must also come great nails.